Hi, it's your host, Laura Carlson, and I've got a quick request. For an upcoming episode, we want to hear your stories. Has the pandemic caused you to seek mental health care? If you're willing to talk about it, we'd like you to leave us a voicemail at 1-646-324-3490. Tell us as much or as little as you want about your need to reach out for help, and then tell us whether you've been able to find it. That number again is 1-646-324-3490. We may use your voice on an upcoming episode. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Prognosis. It's day 22 since coronavirus was declared a global pandemic. Today, how long will it take to develop a vaccine? But first, today's news. A new intelligence report suggests China has concealed the extent of its coronavirus outbreak. Three U.S. officials told Bloomberg about a classified report the intelligence community sent to the White House, saying China underreported both its total cases and deaths. The officials asked not to be identified because the report is secret and did not describe its contents in detail. But, they said, the thrust of the report is that China's public reporting on cases and deaths is intentionally incomplete. In the U.S., which now has the largest public reported outbreak in the world, estimates show as many as 240,000 Americans could die from COVID-19. And that's with mitigation efforts in place. Based on these projections, U.S. President Donald Trump took a newly sober tone in a Tuesday briefing. I want every American to be prepared for the hard days that lie ahead. We're going to go through a very tough two weeks. And then hopefully, as the experts are predicting, as I think a lot of us are predicting after having studied it so hard, we're going to start seeing some real light at the end of the tunnel. But this is going to be a very painful Very, very painful two weeks. For weeks, Trump had downplayed the threat of the virus, frequently telling reporters that it would simply go away. But at the Tuesday briefing, Deborah Birx, the top public health official coordinating the coronavirus task force, cited an estimate that U.S. deaths would be between 100 and 200,000, even with the most stringent mitigation measures in place. Mitigation measures like isolating people in their communities have started to show signs of working in some countries. Lockdown steps in the Netherlands seem to be having an effect. The number of fatalities and hospital admissions in the country is increasingly slower than would be expected without such measures, said a Dutch research institute. Russian President Vladimir Putin has begun holding meetings remotely from his residence outside Moscow, after being exposed to a doctor who was later diagnosed with coronavirus, said a Kremlin spokesman. The Kremlin says that Putin is regularly tested and is fine. Now for today's main story. Why does a vaccine take so long? Scientists around the world are racing to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. But experts have said it could take a year to 18 months for one to hit the market. And some think even 18 months is conservative. The process for testing and approving a vaccine is long and complicated. That can be frustrating when the coronavirus is taking more and more lives every day. But cutting corners to push a vaccine through faster can lead to devastating consequences. We know that because it's happened before. Jason Gale has more on what it takes to develop a working vaccine and just how close we are to finding one for the virus. Today, uh, we met with the big, great pharmaceutical companies, and they're really working hard and they're working smart. And we had some we had a great meeting today with a lot of the great companies and uh, they're going to have vaccines, I think, relatively soon. And they're going to have 
something that makes you better, and that's going to actually take place, we think, even sooner. So it's a lot of good things are happening. But we have strong borders and really are tough. You could be forgiven for thinking we already have a vaccine for the coronavirus. And actually, that's sort of true. There are several, but they're only in the experimental stages. Healthy adults were immunised with an investigational vaccine in Seattle in mid-March. These volunteers are due for a second shot in the upper arm in a week or so. It's part of clinical research funded by the National Institutes of Health that will continue for 12 months, which means it'll take more than a year to fully evaluate the safety and efficacy of the vaccine candidate. And there's a good reason for not cutting any corners. No one knows exactly how serious this threat could be. Nevertheless, we cannot afford to take a chance with the health of our nation. In 1976, a late winter outbreak of swine flu at a military base in Fort Dix, New Jersey, led to fears of a devastating pandemic. President Gerald Ford announced a mass vaccination plan. First, I am asking the Congress to appropriate $135 million for the production of sufficient vaccine to inoculate every man, woman and child in the United States. Congress passed a liability act that basically indemnified the United States government for the safety of the vaccine. A first shot was withdrawn over safety concerns, leaving a second. By the end of the year, 40 million out of some 200 million Americans got the jab. Problem was, no pandemic appeared. But that second vaccine, well... One of those who did roll up her sleeve was Judy Roberts. She was perfectly healthy, an active woman when in November of 1976, she took her shot. Two weeks later, she says, she began to feel a numbness starting up her legs. I joked about it at that time. I said, I'll be numb to the knees by Friday as it, if this keeps up. By the following week, I was totally paralyzed. It was linked to an immune dysfunction, a disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. Here's Laurie Garrett, a Pulitzer Prize winning science writer who covered the story. And so a fair percentage of the recipients, I mean, when I say a fair percentage, less than 1%, but more than the zero that would be the norm, came down with Guillain-Barre, which causes paralysis. And, um, you know, it kind of stunned the nation. And because there was this giant pot of gold, meaning the indemnification that Congress had done, lawyers came out of the woodwork from everywhere. And the lawsuits persisted in federal courts for well over a decade. And that was a real mess. Needless to say, governments and vaccine makers are a lot more cautious. In fact, it wasn't unusual for a vaccine to take 10 years to develop. Newer technology has helped speed up the process, but the real breakthrough came in 2014. The World Health Organization was able to coordinate clinical trials to test the safety of an experimental vaccine for Ebola, A parallel study gauged the optimal dose needed for immunity. It demonstrated a new way of truncating early clinical research into just a few months. And that meant doctors could begin testing the Ebola vaccine in large numbers of people in West Africa just six months after the first person was given the shot. The brains behind that expedited research and development plan is Dr. Murray Paul Kearney. She's a veteran vaccinologist who was an assistant director general at the WHO. You don't want to uh, to confront people with a preparation which is not protecting them against the disease. So at month six, we were able to start the phase three clinical trial in several thousand people to test whether it is efficacious. And this phase... Turned out it was successful. So it took about a year for scientists to determine that the candidate Ebola vaccine worked. The vaccine is made by Merkin Company, It was subsequently registered, and it's played a huge role in containing a more recent Ebola outbreak in the Congo. And Murray Paul's process for fast-tracking research during outbreaks informed a blueprint that research teams around the world are using now for testing not just COVID-19 vaccines, but also drug treatments and diagnostics. Already, two candidate vaccines for COVID-19 are being studied in humans, Besides the one that the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and Moderna are developing, there's a trial underway of a vaccine in China. In addition, the WHO counts 52 other experimental immunizations in preclinical study. Here's Murray Paul again. And when they start clinical trial, they will need most likely a year 
to be sure that this vaccine work and, and to be able to start using it in people. Murray Paul retired from the WHO in 2017 and is back working as a director of research for INSERM, the French National Health Research Organization. She's also on a pandemic committee advising French President Emmanuel Macron. She says the time it will take to develop a vaccine for the coronavirus means we need to do as much as we can now to slow its spread and to find drug treatments. But what if there was already a safe and inexpensive vaccine on the market to blunt the pandemic? Well, maybe there is. Bacillus Kalmick-Guerin, or BCG, is the name of the tuberculosis vaccine that's been around for a century. It's safe, it's inexpensive, and we give it to 130 million newborns a year, mostly in countries where the lung disease is still a major health problem. But the shot isn't just used to prevent TB. It has some off-target benefits, and it's a common immunotherapy for early-stage bladder cancer. It also seems to train the body's first-line immune defense to better fight infections. Scientists are seeing if it can be effectively repurposed to fight COVID-19, starting with healthcare workers. Um, As you know, it's probably going to take many months before a specific vaccine for COVID-19 is developed. And in the meantime, we need to think of every possible way that we can protect healthcare workers who, of course, are at very high risk. And there's going to be particular need to reduce the amount of time that our healthcare workers are absent. This is Professor Nigel Curtis. He's head of infectious diseases research at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne. He's also head of the infectious diseases unit at the city's Royal Children's Hospital. Staff there volunteered to get the BCG vaccine this week in a randomised controlled trial involving 4,000 healthcare workers. Even people who got the shot as an infant are eligible to participate. That's because any beneficial off-target effects of the vaccine are probably lost with time, Nigel says. We will follow our participants for the following six months or however long coronavirus lasts in Australia. And we will compare those who didn't didn't get the BCG vaccine to see whether, first of all, they actually develop symptoms of COVID-19. And if they do, how severe those symptoms are. And that will enable us to see whether the vaccine and both reduces the number of people who become affected by the virus and and whether it can reduce the impact of that. So particularly, not only how unwell they are, but how long that means they have to be off work, which of course is the very important thing for healthcare workers. Similar research is underway in the Netherlands, and other testing sites are planned in Australia and possibly the US. The study's data monitoring committee will review the results after three months to look for any signs that the approach is working. Nigel says he's optimistic, but there are no guarantees. The only way to find out is by doing a clinical trial. That's it for the Prognosis Daily Edition. For more on the coronavirus crisis from 120 bureaus around the world, visit Bloomberg.com slash coronavirus. If you appreciate the podcast, please take a moment to rate us and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to help more listeners find our global reporting. The Prognosis Daily Edition is hosted by me, Laura Carlson. The show is produced by me, Topher Forges, Jordan Gaspure, and Magnus Henriksen. Reporting by Jason Gale. Original music by Leo Sidrin. Our editors are Francesca Levy and Rick Schein. Francesca Levy is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>